thank you very much. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about developing and integrating WebSharp applications with Facebook. And for those of you who, who don't know anything about WebSharp applications, these are applications written in F Sharp and transcompiled into JavaScript using the WebSharp framework. Uh, so this is one of those development frameworks or platforms where you write code in one language and you basically get full-blown web applications uh, distilled from your F Sharp code in this case. So uh, let me just uh, introduce myself in case you don't know me. Um, I'm a, I'm a three-time uh, F-Sharp MVP now, uh, since 2010. Uh, I co-authored uh, four F-Sharp books, uh, three of them with uh, Don Syme, who is the designer of F-Sharp, as you probably know. Uh, and actually, I founded a company in 2004 called Intellifactory. Uh, this is the F-Sharp company, as we, we, name, we call it. Uh, we do everything in F-Sharp. We have over 150 some projects, and every single one of them is in. Um, okay. So, here are some of the books, and the interesting one is the last one we just came out uh, about a couple weeks ago. So, anybody interested in mobile programming in particular, that uh, third edition now has a substantial amount of mobile material in it. Uh, in F Sharp. All right, uh, so we are a small company. Uh, we were founded in 2004. We do mostly research and nowadays some product development. Uh, like I said, we built up some significant expertise in F Sharp uh, by completing over 100 plus projects. Um, we like combining creative ideas and, and cutting edge research, and typically uh, nowadays uh, that's going into web and mobile programming and, and basically uh, developer uh, productivity tools. Um, okay, so let's talk about Web Sharper. So I, I actually have a few slides on Web Sharper so that you understand uh, the background of the whole uh, framework here. And then when you start looking at the application code, you will have a sense of how actually it's working, how, it's get, how it gets translated to uh, uh, F Sharp and, and uh, uh, JavaScript for the client side. So WebShop is an enterprise-ready framework. Uh, it's been uh, pretty stable and mature for, for several years now. Uh, we started releasing the first betas in 2009. So it's been around for two, three years in a, in a pretty stable way now. Uh, basically, in a single line, it allows you to write all your server and your client code in F Sharp. You don't have to worry about calling JavaScript. You don't have to worry about including JavaScript libraries. Uh, you just write code in F Sharp, typically even without caring about web concepts. So it's perfect for individuals who don't like or know anything about the web because it's aimed, it's supposed to abstract away all these details and giving you a web-free environment to program in and then fill in the web parts uh, as you know, the translation uh, proceeds by the, the framework itself. Basically, we don't produce just JavaScript code. We actually produce complete web and mobile, web-based mobile applications, which is a major difference between the other competing frameworks that just aim to produce you JavaScript from IL, JavaScript from C Sharp, JavaScript from different languages. And then you end up manually uh, munging in and, and you know, massaging the end result with your own libraries to get it to work. So here we basically give you a complete web application that you can just single click, deploy, and get it going. You can interface with any client-side JavaScript library, and this is one of the points that people typically misunderstand. Uh, by this, we mean that you can take any JavaScript library and address it uh, in WebSharper using F# -sharp code, which means you get TypeScript API, uh, you get uh, basically uh, you can forget about having to manually track all the different CSS and all the different image and all the artifacts associated with those libraries. Basically, WebSharp or the framework itself will take care of tracking all those uh, for you. And that, the four, first uh, few uh, of these points were about the translator itself. We also have uh, built powerful functional abstractions on the top of this uh, compiler. And that's basically most of Web Sharper now, uh, these functional abstractions. So we have different abstractions to uh, 
uh, represent the different web and mobile chores in a type safe manner in F Sharp. And some of these include, you know, as a side effect, things like automated or automatic resource management, safe URLs, and so on and so on. I actually have a couple of slides on a couple of these abstractions. Uh, one is uh, formlets, the other one is uh, sitelets, uh, so that you can familiar, familiarize yourselves uh, with those concepts before we delve into the, the main application. But overall, uh, in our experience, you end up with a lot less code if you do this uh, sort of uh, uniform uh, language development model uh, for, for your applications. You typically end up at least half, uh, but many times even as little as one-tenth of the similar or equivalent code base if uh, written in ASP.NET with C-sharp and JavaScript. So there's a huge amount of savings to be had, uh, and a lot, of the, uh, a lot of that saving actually uh, really distills in tangible benefits. Uh, the maintenance is much easier uh, because the code base is much smaller and so on and so on. And by that you save money. Okay, so now let's, let's check into this. So basically, How long, so yep. you might have asked questions. No, 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 please do. How long did it take to develop? How many man years? Oh, I think we put in, yes. by now, I think we, we have easily put in about 25, 28, maybe even 30 man years. Okay. So I'm just counting by five, six people yeah. per year, full time, uh, working on this for four or five years now. And the actual integration with JavaScript, can you just pick any client-side JavaScript library and then assume, yeah? Yeah, that's, that's right. You can pick any JavaScript library and I will show you, because that's, exactly what I'm going to talk about today, how you interface with Facebook in this example. So Facebook has a fairly large API, it's all JavaScript, and in this case we're going to demonstrate how you can use that API and program against it in F Sharp. Okay. And basically erecting that kind of a uh, wrapping around the, the Facebook API. So it's a web development framework like I've been explaining. It's pretty much the same as GWT, if you know that for Java people. Uh, but here, uh, the language uh, mismatch is much larger than Java and JavaScript. Here, F Sharp and JavaScript, sometimes from a few lines of F Sharp code, you can actually have hundreds of lines of JavaScript code that, that is equivalent to the uh, same expressivity. So by raising that kind of abstraction level and using a different language, uh, we hope to demonstrate that people can get really, really productive writing web applications. All right, um, we basically, so how do we do this? I don't want to really describe this because this talk is not about WebSharper itself, uh, but I put in a couple of slides just so that you understand that we take the language, we compile, uh, we translate uh, what, what you have written. We, have, we analyze the different data values, the data types, the functions uh, you call and how you call it. And basically we, we, for most of it, we can actually automatically translate that to JavaScript. But for a lot of it, we need, uh, we need to say, well, this and this .NET function that you just called is equivalent of the following JavaScript. And so we have two different kinds of mechanisms for extensibility. One is extensibility on the .NET front. The other one is extensibility on JavaScript front. And so far, we have been saying that, yeah, you can pull in any kind of JavaScript library. That's the latter extensibility. But for the translation to actually take place, we also need the other extensibility, which is how you translate .NET code into JavaScript. And that's what we call proxying. I'm not going to talk about proxying today. So what this slide says is that we have provided proxies for most of F Sharp and some of the standard libraries uh, in .NET. So system.string and stuff like that, you know, the basics and even regular expressions and a lot of other things are proxied. They have been proxied and therefore you can use it in your code and basically what this means is if you take pretty much any F sharp code written against the .NET framework we'll just translate to uh, web sharper into JavaScript without any kind of hassles. In case we have a function that we can translate we'll let you know and then you can provide a proxy for the function or uh, download some extension uh, that actually is a .NET proxy extension. So it's a extensible uh, development model. So it's the union part. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it has all the basic stuff and all the 
even advanced. So the F-sharp language-wise, we have covered everything but reflection. And there are some minor corner cases in different other areas that probably nobody will ever use. But reflection, of course, is a single uh, exception to the rule that it get, can be translated because we don't have the same kind of meta information on clients. You know, like in JavaScript execution, you don't have information about the types that you have on the, on, on, on the .NET side. Sure. So, but in, in a JavaScript piece of code, you could have, you can um, pattern match the recursive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, you can pattern match. You can use active patterns. You can use computation expressions. You can use everything but reflection. You, like I said, you can use the entire language. And in fact, uh, with F Sharp 3, you have uh, type providers. So type providers uh, can be used uh, for lots of things. And typically in, in web shop applications, we have type providers in our, some of our uh, applications. You typically end, end up using them on the server side to fetch some data or abstract away the, some parts of the data source and you know, give strongly typedness around this data source and expose it to some client. And so that exposition or exposing is, is taking place using the translator and the type providers run on the server side. Okay, so yeah. is there potentially a way to use the type providers to in the JavaScript third party? Uh, that, would, that would be possible if, if you could push through uh, not only the code for the type provider, but you could, if you could also emulate how type providers are hooked in, yeah, sure. like you have Visual Studio hooks. But yeah, that, that would be tremendously interesting. The only problem with that is that typically the kind of things that you use a type provider for, you need the server side because there's some kind of data awareness which typically deals with sensitive data which you don't want to have on the client. So there's a trade-off. But of course, nothing really stops you and like I said, there could be all kinds of type providers. All right, uh, we have seamless environment and tool integration. So you download a, a web shop into Visual Studio, you will get templates, you, you get F5, you can uh, you know, single click deploy and so on and so on. And we have legacy support for ASP.NET and MVC applications. So you can take an existing ASP.NET application and from today you can start expanding it and adding functionality to it in F Sharp. Which then suddenly will make your productivity curve, we believe, much more steep. Okay, so here's a list of the basic abstractions. Uh, in WebSharp, we have pagelets. These are the basic building blocks for client-side functionality expressed in F-Sharp. Then you have sidelets, you have uh, sitelets, you have formlets for uh, modeling in a composable and type-safe way web forms. And then we have extensions. These are the ones, these are your bridges to different JavaScript libraries. That's the example I'm going to use today, an, an example for an extension. Uh, and then we have something coming up which we haven't yet released. These are called slidelets. These can be used to model mobile and Windows 8 applications, which we believe is, is going to be really, really cool and very productive. So sitelets, uh, like I said, just a single s slide on this. They are type-safe, composable, and first-class website, web application values in F Sharp. Uh, they are instantiated or abstracted over a, uh, an action type, which is typically used in other MVC type uh, frameworks. Uh, so you have an action type that in a strongly typed manner uh, aims to express the different pieces of functionality, the different entry points into your application. So here's an example. This is actually coming out from the basic template that we ship with WebShopper. There's a sample application uh, that has a home page, a contact page, some page that is protected and you need logged in, and then logging in and logging out, and some echo functionality for, you know, pinging uh, a web resource and getting it back. So that's the type signature for the type. And then the site that you erect around that type will serve that type. And you just need to say how it will actually be served. So that's what site lets describe. And once you have described that, you can put it in a DLL. You can drop that DLL in a web shopper aware container. And suddenly you can serve the website or the web application from it. And these can be REST services, they can be web applications, they can be just static sites, whatever. You can in, in, encapsulate the whole thing in a single DLL. And of course, you can build extensions in DLLs as well that you can ship 
parts of functionality uh, that can be reused in other applications. You can ship them as DLLs. So they are really, really nice building blocks. So here's an example where how, how you can actually get something done and something served back to the user. So here we have an XML file, and what we use, uh, this is the older model that we used to have. Uh, we no longer have, uh, or we no longer advocate using this, but just for the sake of comparison, because in the next slide I have a dynamic version. So this is the uh, static version. So what we do is we basically consume an XML file at compilation time. We distill F-sharp code from it that will have a type signature. And you can instantiate that function that now you get in the generated file to produce an HTML or whatever web content. And that's how you do it. You basically instantiate that it will be generated on the templates.skin. Skin is coming from the file name of the XML file. This is some XML file that your designer may give you. Like, hey, uh, developers, this is your new template for the new web application. Please install it into the application is you're working it standardized on. standardized or is it specific um, to Web Sharper? Uh, this is a Web Sharper thing. Okay. So you can't go to a graphics design agency and say, hey, please design me a skin or design me a template? Uh, no, you can. So what, what I meant by specialization yeah. is that whenever somebody has designed you a template, this is just a plain set of CSS and HTML files coming from the designer. The programmer then goes into the template and removes some of the static content and, and puts in a placeholder. And he says, well, here is going to be the menu. Here is going to be the main content. So the typical templating stuff. And the way you do that whole definition, you know, like defining and going from a single, a single static HTML into a, a template is web sharper specific. And the whole compilation that takes place, this whole path, is also web sharper specific. So we generate code from that template. But we have found that in practice, this is not very nice. Because if we have a web application and you say, well, uh, we kind of goofed up, uh, we need to change something in the markup. Well, then we have to recompile the whole thing and then redeploy, and that's not very nice. So for that, uh, addressing that, we have this more uh, dynamic template. It's a different mechanism, and here's the code, uh, how you can actually uh, consume it without any kind of other uh, compilation step involved. You take a main HTML file, you embed holes or placeholders in it the same way as before, uh, but in this case, I mean, these are two functions that we, we give you in the templates uh, that you can start these kind of uh, applications from WebSharper, but you can write them yourself. Uh, we, we use some functions from, from the content module that can actually consume an HTML file or an XML file, and it can look for placeholders, and it can dynamically plug in content into those placeholders, and, and bless you, and <laughs> uh, expose those different placeholders in a type-safe manner based on a type definition. This, so, this is not too far from looking classic as default. Yes. Even though this is type safe yeah. and ASP.NET is not. Oh, yeah, that's but I mean, with respect to having the placeholders and you, know, you, get, you get the HTML from the designer, but then you know, they want this menu here and you need to keep control of it. Yeah. Then yeah. You, yeah, you, you can basically do everything here that you could do with ASP.NET or with the static templating that I showed you. The, the main huge difference between this and ASP.NET is that. First of all, not everything is a string, and not everything is a control that is the same type as any other control. Here you can erect a type-safe interface onto your page, and then you couple that with a template that is supposed to supply the same kind of signature. And then as long as they are in sync, your code will always be type-checked, and it will always work. But as soon as you start making changes to the template that are not in sync with the type def above, like you add the body, another body whole placeholder, which doesn't get instantiated, then suddenly you get a runtime error. So you just need to make sure that these holes and your type defs are in sync. And by the way, the type defs, the records can be uh, typed differently. Like that one is a body placeholder. Typically, I can see it. It's for a list of elements. So it's meant for web content, inserting web com content. But you can have a, a hole that has a type string or int, whatever. It's all up to how you render that in. And those are all encapsulated in functions like this. 
Uh, that's a nice formalism because w w with the function called with template, all you have to do is give a body, which is basically a series of HTML uh, uh, combinators representing markup in F sharp, and it will include it and embed it into the uh, main.html file and serve it back to you. What happens if you provide broken HTML? Um, and I'm talking from experience where we had nightmares going in saying, oh, we want strict HTML. Uh, we'll parse it, we'll check it, we'll reject it, we'll force programmers to do it right. And you know, once you have insecurity, well, well, when you don't require it from the start, yeah. you, you just don't. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is driven by the doc type that uh, is marked on your HTML file. So if you say that your doc type is just plain HTML5, then you get some pretty significant amount of uh, dynamism. But if, if you say, if, if you state an older doc type, it will actually insist, like an XML doc type, for example, it will insist that it has to be parsed as XML. Yeah. And it will reject things like you not closing p tags and so on and so on. And those will fail runtime in this scenario. In the other one, in the static one, it will fail at compilation time. But, but most people don't want to have to recompile. So most of our applications are using the dynamic templates nowadays. We actually are experimenting with a third one, but I think it's too early to describe that. But it basically gives you not only this sort of a type safety erected on the top of markup, but it also gives you type safety erected dynamically on injected JavaScript elements as well, which I think is pretty far out there for now. Uh, let's just leave that in the back of our minds. Um, so here's how you basically combine up sites from sitelet combinators. There are different combinators like sitelet.content, sitelet.protect, sitelet.infer, sitelet.sum. So you basically have uh, basic ways of, com uh, of uh, creating sitelet values and summing them up to form larger sitelets. And these basically will be served as your whole application. Uh, the other uh, abstraction found uh, in WebShopper is formlets. They give you the same kind of type safety and composability as uh, sitelets. Uh, they are a little bit more refined uh, because we also have taken the uh, concept. Well, first of all, formlets have a, a nice theory. So you can find academic papers, you know, of format uh, in implementations in Haskell, in uh, Clean, in different other languages. And the first one for F# -sharp was our formats library. Uh, there's another couple of ones I think by now, but none of them have dependent formats, and none of them have flowlets. And these are coming from the fact that we actually are rendering formats using our own interpretation of formats. So here's an example so we know what we are talking about. So here's a function called TB that takes two arguments and it gives you a text box with a basic validation and a label and uh, some message if you fail the validation. So in the general form of composing formats is that one in the, uh, in the rectangular box in red. So you basically take n formats, you compose them with that funky operator and the sum or the composite value coming out of all these subformats can be also composed and returned back as the result of the combined format. So that's the syntax. And here's an example using the TB function. So uh, as you can see, we have two text boxes with validation. Uh, both of them are validating on emptiness. So you cannot submit until you actually put something in. Uh, we have more refined validators, but the TB function, if you have looked carefully here, it only insists on the value entered not being empty. I could have said, hey, I want this value validated as an email address. I want to ha have it validated as an integer, and so on and so on. So you can have a lot of different validators. But once you start combining these, there's your uh, star operator and the formlet yield, and then you get a, f a combined formlet, which you are now wrapping and adding a submit and reset button, you add it and wrap it in a legend box, and you add the form container to give some sort of a nicer uh, layout of CSS. So from th those five or 10 lines, you get that web form that actually performs client-side validation, doesn't allow you to submit until you fill in uh, some values, and then it posts it back as a record of string string, which... Going back a couple of slides, I mean, you know, a bit of that layout. 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is what I meant. So, so when when you take a format like this, so here's a format, right? Uh, it's it's in a box. It has buttons and things. Imagine that there's another format like this. You want to put two formats next to each other, but well, you probably don't want to have two submit two sets of submit buttons because they go on the end. So you combine without the buttons, but you say combine these two, but render it horizontally relative to each other. And then you get it laid out like this. Well, that's the implementation that we have the rendering logic for formats. And indeed, we use tables. We probably could have done it using divs or some other CSS3 or whatever. Yeah, if they wanted to design the form, they are likely going to be using CSS heavily and saying, well, this text box has a background, this button has this and this background, and these and these, you know, extra CSS properties. So what you end up doing... How would you work with this? Are they two completely separate Well, first of all, you can, you can provide your own in interpretation of formats and the whole rendering. It's not bad. It's 200, 300 lines of code you, you, can, you can customize for your needs. And then you just provide your own uh, rendering logic of going from here to actually HTML or HTML5 markup. That's not difficult. But let's say you stick with ours. So then you observe, for example, that here's a formlet, and the buttons have some kind of a class called button. And then now your designer has given you a different uh, uh, design with the CSS class for buttons, you know, doing more funky stuff. So what you want to do, well, you can either have the designer give you the right class names, or you can, in your format definition, you can, this is not very nice, we, 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 would, we would say that that would be an impure way of specifying this, but nothing really holds you from uh, saying things like, okay, here's a button, but add an extra CSS class to it. Just like with these other enhanced enhance dot something, enhance dot something. We have a whole suite of enhance dot something functions. And some of these functions have, have to do with things like, oh, add, uh, add the CSS attribute to this. And so what you would do is you would look at the design of your designer, and you would observe that, yeah, he's using this and this and this class on buttons, and on a parent container, this and this and this class. Then you add those to your format definition. And suddenly, the code that you get from your formlets will look like the ones that your designer gave you. Yeah, so th 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 I mean, this is something that you pretty often do and have to do, unfortunately. But like I said, it's kind of impure because you end up spoiling this nice functional definition because this talks about what do I want to get to? And it doesn't talk about how you want to get to it. Because right now, that's an instantiation of our logic of rendering a format like that into actual rendered form. This is something important, and I think on the next slide, yes. So we have different JavaScript UI control sets that we have provided a rendering logic with. So you take the same code, you take this. We have an instantiation for jQuery UI, a Yahoo UI, XGS, and jQuery Mobile, and we are always working on new ones. So basically, you take the same code here, but you use jQuery Mobile formlets instead of the standard Web Sharper formlets, and suddenly you have formlets that look like Nice mobile formlets. So we have tried to do the work for you, but if you have a designer giving you some very funky design, then you may have to do the same so yourself. This is just a, a different, uh, of the rendering. Yeah, that's, that's using jQuery mobile formlets, th this form there. I couldn't find a better screenshot, sorry. But you probably see that the buttons look actually mobile -y. Uh, The uh, checkbox looks mobile -y. It doesn't look like an HTML checkbox. That's because jQuery Mobile has a nice uh, way of expressing a checkbox. So anyway, we, we basically give you different rendering. And, and I'm mostly impressed with the, uh, well, first of all, the jQuery UI gives you this fairly standard look and feel that people like. And you know, it can also be customized and skinned fairly easily. But we have, for example, the XGS formlets, uh, which is a library we haven't released. We're using it heavily internally uh, to build applications. Uh, 
allow you to basically go from a few lines of code like this to really professionally looking uh, user interfaces because we use, for example, uh, libraries like XJS or Central Touch. So that's a massive uh, productivity increase, we believe. And just to wrap up on the extension topic, we have, I don't know, a few dozen, a couple dozen at least different extensions uh, for GIS, for data visualization, for HTML5, and so on and so on. So all these different JavaScript libraries that I picked some samples from, you can use them with F-sharp code and address them with F-sharp code. And you get charts, you get maps with uh, markers and things like that. Uh, you can even have full HTML5 support, like you have different libraries like WebGL, O3D, GL Matrix. You can write, this is actually an application from Google, uh, but we had transcribed it into F Sharp using Web Sharp. It's about a thousand lines. It's a, it's a game where you can actually rotate the table, you can change your viewport, and you can shoot the balls, and they all roll around, and they go and sync, and so on and so on. So it's a fully, it's a full-fledged uh, snooker game in a 500 1300 lines. Did you use any mutations? Uh, so GL Matrix, uh, which is one of the libraries inside in this application, and O3D, which is Google's own library, uh, uses heavy amounts of mutation. But in this case, those are all encapsulated in the JavaScript library. So in the code, uh, we had tried to transcribe it and make it more functional. This is why the code went down from about 2,000 some lines to almost half. So we saved about 30% by rewriting it. We didn't just transcribe it one by one. We actually transcribed it and look at, looked at the logic and said, well, we could have iterated through this array instead of a for loop and whatever and whatever. So we had nicely restructured the whole thing. The code size went down a bit, and the application was the same. How many simultaneously connected users can you have? In, on a single machine. You mean if, if I have a... Yeah, I'm thinking historically where Windows and .NET wasn't, didn't have one of the best socket handling capabilities. Yeah, I mean, nowadays the socket handling and, and, and you know... It's being cleaned up and it's Yeah, cleaned yeah, cleaned very up. much so. So, it, so first of all, WebShopper doesn't deal with that kind of level. No, no, it can. Yeah. But so you're still using a you know, .NET framework, and uh, sure. So you're dependent on you know, third-party technology. Yes, in, in, and in our case, we, we typically are only requiring, in order to run web shopper applications that have a server side. So first of all, you can have web shopper applications that are fully client. So you write them in F Sharp, you get a whole bunch of JavaScript code. We even package it into mobile applications and so on and so on. But they won't have any server side to contact. So on these kind of applications, this is not an issue. Yes, no, exactly. But for the ones that have a server side, so the only things that we, well, this is not something we require. This is this is how it's designed in the first place. We want it to be compatible with ASP.NET. So in order to run any web shop application with a server side, you need an ASP.NET compatible container, IIS. Or if you are running on Linux, you can have uh, Apache with ASP.NET, uh, mod, the uh, module for ASP.NET. Um, there are many, many uh, open source web containers nowadays that are falling in this category. So they are ASP.NET compatible, but they also come up with coming up with some new stuff. So there's this uh, web API, as they call it, this new standard coming up. Uh, it's also driven by, by Microsoft. There are a couple open source initiatives to sort of unify like what should be the interface from outside for a web container? So you design applications for that abstract description of web containers, but you can then port it into any container. You don't have to be stuck with IS, IIS. So all that is coming. I mean, it's, it's no, no big deal. Uh, we have at some point even entertained the idea of writing our own web server. We have even gone, probably implemented more than half of it. But then we said, ah, and, and it's still, I mean, very, very attractive. So you take this F-sharp thing, and you compile it, and you get an executable, which serves only your application and nothing else. So it's more secure because it doesn't have a whole bunch of other security, uh, you know, risky points. Uh, but then we had realized that, oh, well, what if the client wants to actually connect to that server uh, through HTTPS, you know, and then we had to, like, 
actually building the same kind of things that other people have long built into other frameworks like or containers like IIS. So why would we have to duplicate functionality? So we sort of gave up on you know, our own web sharp or web server project. It's still sitting there, so we could probably pick it up any time, but I don't have any plans to do that. Um, how are we doing with time? Because I have like a zillion slides. So there's another component in, inside WebSharper. You know, this is a whole framework and technology called WebSharper Mobile. I'm not going to talk about this. It basically provides packaging capabilities. Uh, you can multi-target, scale things into the cloud, and so on and so on. This is something that, uh, if you're interested, I can answer some questions after the talk. And basically, uh, motivation for the WebSharper Mobile component is that almost everything is becoming about JavaScript nowadays. You have JavaScript becoming the IL of desktop applications with Windows 8, mobile applications, you know, uh, the phone gap style mobile applications, so web-based applica web mobile applications. You can write all these now with WebSharper. Uh, HTML5 applications, clearly the future. Uh, here's a project we did at the uh, beginning of the year. This was something I presented at uh, CUFP about. This is a uh, bioinformatics application. This is actually, this shows the, the gene uh, functional breakdown of uh, the bacteria above, which has some really, really interesting uh, medical research implications. So anyway, now let's talk about Facebook, because after all, we, we want to do Facebook today, right? Uh, so here's an application. Uh, I grayed out some components so you don't see who posted and whose. Uh, <laughs> Uh, timeline we are viewing. But so what I want to demonstrate is how you can do an application like this in like 10 minutes. So what does this application do? You can run this first of all as a standalone web application. You can run this in your phone and you can run this if you want as a Facebook app installed under the Facebook platform. It's all web-based. All three di different ones that I mentioned are web-based. So what this is supposed to do, if you, if you can probably, maybe you cannot see, but on the top there are these buttons that give you login and log out capabilities. And then if you're logged in, you get this extra button that says get my latest wall posts. And if you click that button, what it will do is it will go out to, to Facebook, it will get all your uh, stuff, and it will give it back to you. But it will give it back to you, that would be too easy just to, get, to show it to you as is. So we have decided that we're going to give you nice things. So if, if a wall post actually has sub items like comments, then you can slide into those comments by clicking on the uh, actual light line item. So first of all, uh, I can show you the code or we can start with the slides. I think it's better to start with the slide. So what you have to do in order to set up an application like this, it doesn't matter how small or large, you can write the, the next, I don't know, cloud or whatever, the, the massively used application, or you can write something small. You still need to configure your Facebook application with Facebook. So you go to the developers.facebook.com site, uh, you get you need to get an account as a developer first, but that's free. Uh, you get an account and you can start creating apps. And the only things to, to, to configure for an app is you need to name it. And it will get an app ID which is unique. And then you can start basically configuring some basic, really basic things about the application. And most importantly, where it's located. Where the server side will reside on a public URL. So here there's a Heroku uh, domain. You get that integrated with Facebook automatically, so you don't need to have your own hosting. You can go on Facebook, have, a, have an app that I was just showing you, and you can just shove it up into Heroku, and then it will be hosted there and exposed on the Facebook. Uh, so that's basically uh, the configuration. And now when you have everything, I mean, these two pages are like one minute configuration, but if you observe carefully, at the end you get an app ID. So you grab that app ID, and I'm graying that out so nobody will misuse the one that I have managed to configure. You take the app ID and you can start coding. But now, this is the important piece, we're going to talk about how you can actually address the Facebook API from F Sharp, using Web Sharper. This is what I was referring to before as an extension to Facebook. So here's the extension to Facebook that gives you login, and getting uh, status updates. 
uh, if you can, which part should I explain? So th this is the gist. This is from the top down. There are a whole bunch of things inside this definition, and then there's a, a FB module, which is a class, with at least three different functions or methods. A login, a get login status, and an API. Don't get scared with these. Th these operators are meant to basically give you uh, the same kind of type operators that you have in normal f -sharp language, but they are expressed as functions that have a different meaning so that we can reflect on them differently and therefore we can provide the kind of functionality that this whole binding is supposed to provide. So this basically login is a function that takes a function that takes a login response and returns a unit and it also takes an optional login option typed value and it will return unit. What is login options? Well, it's defined someplace else. It's defined in the dot, dot, dot here. And so on and so on. Uh, and here you can actually see that I'm also requiring some resources. We'll talk about them soon. Uh, when somebody calls any of, these class, or any of these methods from that class. And at the very end, when you represent the whole Facebook API, you have an assembly uh, under this particular namespace. And then among many other things, you have FB, the class FB, which provides the login, logout, and status updates. So for our little app, we only need like three or four different functions. And for, for a simplified uh, rendering here, I'm showing the, the basic skeleton of this. And now let's uh, jump into it. Uh, this is actually defining a, a resource. It says, I have a resource called Facebook API. And the path to it is this long URL. And remember, I have annotated on the FB class this resource. So every time that you use FB.login, FB.API, you will inherently pick up a dependency on that resource. So in a page that serves any kind of dynamic call to these functions from F Sharp, you will always automatically include the Facebook API. Web Sharper will do that for you. All right. So here's the resource. Here's a class definition. I say, well, I have some kind of arguments uh, class uh, which has two members, and they are one of them is a string, the other one is an element type, and so on and so on. Here, here's one that allows you to define optional members. I have some initialization options class that has nothing as a requirement required part, but actually has several parts that are optional with types and so on and so on. So you basically, in a type-safe manner, this is F-sharp code, so it's strongly typed and statically checked. So if you make a mistake, the compiler will tell you before you can compile this. So when you have, a, uh, when you have transcribed your Facebook API into this format, it takes a little bit of getting used to, but not too much, you have a type-safe way of defining what the Facebook API is. In fact, let me just show you that. So you're basically publishing APIs for... Facebook, yes, uh, when we talk about our extensions. So we have dozens of extensions to different things like Google Maps, yeah. uh, some funky visualization library, Facebook API, jQuery Mobile, and so on and so on. And they all look like this. And you can see that this one for the example is 97 lines. And here's the main part, and here's the FB class, and FB class like I'm giving you here, has these functions. And now, in turn, when I'm actually looking at my, my application, I can use those functions. Here's FB int. It actually is the key. Don't look at that. Uh, and then uh, here's, for example, getting your login and logout status and checking if you're logged in or not and things like that. So let me switch back here because it's more understandable. Uh, so you have a few of these basic building blocks of defining user uh, APIs in F# -sharp code. Here's one, for example, for defining a closed set of enumerations. For example, user status can be one of three different things, but nothing else. It can be connected, not authorized, or unknown. That's how you define it. And at this point, if you go into your code, for example, here, here, here's the uh, here's an actual example. That's a property of type user status. It's a strongly typed, you can see the, the three different static constructors inside, and there's only three, and there's nothing else in it. So you cannot construct a status that is incorrect. And underneath, this whole API generation and API de defining and definition 
mechanism will, will map it to the right string value in the JavaScript API, which happens to be one of those three. All right. So I'm supposed to walk through the code, and you probably have observed that it, the code itself is not very long. 97 lines for the binding for the Facebook so API. This is a deep part, uh, yeah. Mapping. Yeah, so... We, we've done something similar in, in Erlang, obviously not as far. In, yeah. yeah, so we, I mean, right now we are experimenting with other means of getting these extensions and bindings. For example, there's TypeScript. TypeScript is this new dynamic language from Microsoft that is supposed to improve on JavaScript. But TypeScript has one of these cool features that you can define up front, kind of like a forward de declaration. You can define types that you will later on use in your, in your JavaScript coding. And using those definitions, they, they have type signatures. Visual Studio, the integrated environment, can give you code completion and code discovery functions because it knows that, yeah, although you're calling JavaScript functions, but somebody has defined an API for them in TypeScript. So TypeScript is supposed to be somewhat of a, a type-safer version of JavaScript. And by using those kind of abstractions, like type definitions and these forward declarations, we can actually also f take those and produce web shopper extensions. And that's one of our little side projects. It, it's a few-day project. It's not, nothing really complicated because it's a straightforward thing. But we now have not only a way to define the API bindings in f -sharp code, but you can also define it in TypeScript. And there are hundreds of JavaScript libraries defined in TypeScript already. So that seems to be a more faster-moving uh, world of bringing JavaScript functionality in a type safe world. So by providing that small extension to actually being able to parse those type declarations and producing the same exact uh, extensions, web shopper extensions, is a massive, massive help. So imagine that either one of these two cases, either from a TypeScript declaration or from a, this is something we call the web shopper interface generator or WIG definition. This is a WIG definition. So the, here I define, I use the f -sharp language itself to embed the, the binding. So once you have it, so th this binding is coming from this uh, f -sharp project, which happens to be referenced, if you can read this, uh, from the consuming uh, web application project. And I think uh, we can just basically pull this up. So here's the code. Uh, that's another 140 lines. That's our whole application. So we use the 100 lines of f -sharp code to bind the parts of API of Facebook that we needed. And then we wrote another 150 lines to get the application that we have seen here. Um, and then you get this application. It will log you in. It will log you out. It will fetch your posts. It will render the posts in a slidable uh, way. So you can slide to view the comments. Otherwise, you just see the pictures and so on and so on. Uh, and just two pieces I want to pick out from this. One is performing logout and login. Uh, here's, the, here's the calls to the FB module and then the members inside to get the status. Are you logged in or not? If not, then log out. If yes, then log in. Uh, and then this is hooked on as, a, as an event handler to a button, which happens to be represented as an A hyperlink. Uh, the other uh, point is getting the wall post. So once again, you have a button, which I just represented as a button get post. And on the click event, you basically start showing a loading message. I mean, I can probably show you. Well, I don't think there's internet. I didn't manage to connect. So there's a, a loading animation while we are fetching the status updates. And when we are done, we remove the animation, which is down here. It says hide loading uh, message. And then in between, we basically fetch and convert to some markup based from the data that we received, and we display it. So here's a jQuery call that basically uh, refreshes uh, based on uh, the data that we have received, whatever you're seeing. So the only things that you have to do at this point, we, you need to put it on a public URL, this application. that. Uh, so here, here's the application. You compile it. Uh, now it's compiled. If you open it, you get a directory with uh, some uh, some JavaScript 
and some uh, HTML file. There's actually one HTML file index.html probably. You need to copy that into pub, a publicly hosted URL, which is the same as the one you configured for your Facebook app, whose ID you have used in the application itself. And then everything sort of ties in together. You get a Facebook application. You can authenticate. You can use the Facebook infrastructure to authenticate and get the wall post and so on and so on. And the little app will just show it for you. So the bottom line is, boom, your application is running. And not only that, you can take the same code base and you can install this as a Facebook application. I was sorry, I was too lazy, so I just picked a random Facebook application. This happens to be TripAdvisor. Uh, <clears throat> so imagine that your application is running right there. So when we talk about Facebook applications, they are just web applications in an iframe. Nothing fancy, nothing spectacular. So the same code base that you have just seen could be uh, put into a Facebook application or it could equally be put into a mobile application. In fact, the project I'm using in Visual Studio to get this uh, compiled is an HTML site project. So let me just quickly show you what, what kind of projects you can do with WebShopper. So here's WebShopper. You can do libraries, you can do extensions. These are the things we talked about. Facebook, the API, the 97 whatever lines that you saw in the other project is of type extension and the site itself is, an, uh, is a project type HTML site. <clears throat> this is a fully offline all dynamic client side HTML and JavaScript project. And then if you go in the bottom there's this Android application for example. It's the same kind of project as an HTML site except it also comes with the packaging ability for Android. So the site that we distilled is packaged into an Android application. So what you can do is you can move all that code, I mean all that code, a single file, and put it into an Android application project, compile it, and you get a package that you can now put on your Android phone, and it will run happily, as long as you have a matching server side that authenticates the user. And then the, the client side will be running on your phone. All right. Uh, so with that, I think I can give a summary. Uh, you can read that. So basically, we, we believe that with just a couple hundred lines of code, you can talk to people that use mobile devices. You can talk and address people that are web people. And you can also talk to or, or target people on Facebook. You can Nowadays, you probably see a massive amount of uh, Facebook applications popping up everywhere, uh, all asking for your uh, different permissions to uh, use your friend's data and whatever. So be careful when you, you know, say, yeah, I want to use this application, because some, some of them are malicious. But there's a hugely growing market opportunity. Um, and the other parts of the Web Shopper framework will give you the scalability of from the desktop to the cloud and, you know, like, I didn't really talk about the uh, cloud aspects here, but because it's a Microsoft technology, you can easily scale it to run on Azure and maybe even other things. So using more powerful functional programming abstractions, we managed to cut development time, and I think that's the key area here, because not just the development type, but also the code base that you have to then maintain, uh, which is much shorter and more maintainable at that point. So just to give you a couple extras, we have fish.net. Uh, this is a community site that we built in WebSharper uh, that collects a bunch of different things. You guys have probably been on it. If not, then go and check. It's fish.net. The other thing that we are working on nowadays is this f -sharp Cloud IDE. Uh, it looks like, it doesn't look like this anymore. It looks much more cool now. Uh, but this is what it looked like about a month ago. Uh, it gives you basically the same kind of capabilities as a Visual Studio Online kind of thing. You can have full-blown projects uh, with a whole tree of projects in your solution corresponding to different projects that may be interdependent, that each have different files. You can open these files. Uh, for f -sharp code files, we provide on-the-fly on the uh, syntax and semantic checking. So as you type, you get red squigglies like the one shown there. Um, and you get a console window where you can interact just like if you had a Linux terminal. You could say ls 
my current directory, create a directory, and then it creates a new solution. So this is like a little terminal inside the ID. And then you also get an interactive shell, which is like FSI. For those of you who use F Sharp and FSI, the F Sharp interactive environment, which basically allows you to just type F Sharp code <coughs> and then click enter, and then you evaluate the code. So it's a REPL uh, environment. And in this case, we have equipped it with some uh, client-side graphing and visualization capabilities, so you can do nice charts and stuff. So this gives you exploratory programming, but on a larger scale than other competing sites like Try F Sharp, for example. So this gives you almost full-blown uh, IDE, where you can edit whole solutions, and in the meantime, do interactive development in the terminal or in the interactive. <coughs> Uh, <laughs> so most of the browsers provide hooks. Yeah, most of the browsers provide hooks so that you can hook onto these special keystrokes. You know, like Control F4 usually closes a tab in almost any browser. You can actually listen to that uh, character combination, and or some of the browsers even give you functions uh, or events that you can hook onto and say, well, if the, if the user wants to close the session or the page, you know, I should be warned. And then you pop up with JavaScript a single pop-up that says, do you really want to leave the page? And then you say cancel, and then you cancel out. So you can hook into these events and sort of, <clears throat> you know, fix them up so they don't actually accidentally close your session. Actually, I'm, I think I'm over time, so feel free to get in touch. Uh, you see here my Twitter. Uh, and my email address, so if you're interested, drop me an email or find me on FISH. Thank you very much. <coughs>